All right, well, some people are still coming in, but I'll start with some of our housekeeping stuff and they can filter in as they do. So welcome, thank you for joining Roebling Road Trip. This is our first of 2023, getting a slow start this year. We've been doing it since 2020. So I mean, how many Roebling sites are there? We're, we're gonna need to uh, start branching out. So I usually do a pitch during my opening remarks for other sites or themes, ideas, bridges that have any kind of relationship to Roebling history. Um, so if anyone has any ideas, feel free to drop those in the chat or uh, submit them under the Q&A because we're always looking for, for new programs to offer. I am dead set on getting some like medical historians to talk to us about the Benz case on disease. I think that one would be really interesting. Uh, so if anyone, there's no idea too crazy, please just uh, let me know. Um, and when you were signing up for or registering for the event, there was definitely an option for people to make a donation and you know, it was a free program, but we've been trying our best to do all of our virtual programs as a pay what you wish program so that anyone who's interested can join us. So thank you for everyone who did make a donation. It really helps us to continue to produce these great programs and also to continue to collect and preserve Roblings history. So my name is Lynn Calamia and I'm the executive director over at Roebling Museum. I started right before the pandemic and I've definitely been saying I'm the new executive director, but by now I've been here oof, over three years, but uh, these programs specifically have really been a huge help in teaching me about Roebling history and getting, you know, like a national perspective on the impact. And I hope you guys have all been enjoying them as well. And of course, everyone who's logged in has been to Roebling Museum, but if you haven't visited yet, and you're still planning a trip, uh, Roebling Museum, it's located in the former company town of Roebling, New Jersey, which is in central, uh, central Pennsylvania, <laughs> that's a different company town, uh, central New Jersey on the Delaware River. The company town is a, a historic district listed on the National Register, it was built in 1905, and I usually say it's about 98% intact, so one building burned down and another one was moved but is still in the town, which is really amazing to have that still exist. The museum is in one of the Roebling steel mill buildings. So uh, it was where you would clock in for the day, the workers would clock in. And we have both indoor and outdoor exhibits that bring to life the story of the people who lived and worked in the company town. And we've also been offering really great walking tours of the company town on Saturdays. And I'm saying that because I lead them. So they are definitely fantastic. So, Today we're gonna to go on a rolling road trip. And for those of you who are actually first, first timers in this program, uh, this is a program series that takes us all around the country. We haven't been around the world yet, but definitely around the country. We could go around the world with rolling bridges. Um, so we've been in Cincinnati. We heard from the national parks with the Allegheny Portage Railroads and uh, definitely the Brooklyn Bridge, maybe twice the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, but definitely, as I said earlier, if you have ideas, please let me know. Uh, we actually have our next rolling road trip posted on the website. It's gonna be of the Bear Mountain Bridge. So for all you New York people, definitely stay tuned for that one. And for all the New Jersey people, I just wanna pitch that our garden tour is this weekend. So um, the garden tour in a former company town is a very unique experience and it allows people to get a deeper look at where the bridge building workers lived with their families. So. You can find that information on our well, on our website as well. So about that, uh, the way that the program is going to run tonight is our guest Blaze will give a PowerPoint presentation and talk about his topic. But while he's talking, I'm going to be managing the chat and the Q&A. So while he's talking, submit questions, make comments, and I'll be managing that so that afterwards we can get right into the Q&A. So Let's get started. Are you ready, please? Yes, all set. Thanks, Lynn. Okay, well, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, excited to talk about this uh, project that I've been working on for many years and finally is under construction. So we have some really good uh, progress to show you, uh, but I'm gonna give you uh, kind of a full history of the project. 
not only an overview, but the history of the bridge, uh, history of our project. Talk a little bit about how a suspension bridge works just to kind of inform you of some of the terminology. And so we're, I'm not saying terms that people don't uh, understand. And then I'll talk about our rehabilitation design and uh, show, you some, show you some good photos of our construction progress to date. So the project is a comprehensive restoration of a 100 year old suspension bridge and comprehensive is not an understatement. We're touching virtually every component of this bridge. I would say perhaps with the one exception of the main cable wires themselves, every other element of this bridge is being uh, restored. And uh, I'll be showing you some details of what exactly that means and all the different pieces of it. I always like to start out by kind of giving credit where credit's due. The bridge is owned by New York State DOT, Department of Transportation, New York State DOT. Um, Majeski and Masters were the engineer of record. We have a sub consultant, KS Engineers, that helped us out. Uh, the bridge is under construction right now. So, construction inspection is being provided by GPI. And the construction, the contractor is uh, a consortium called Wart Street Bridge Constructors of various firms Servidone, GCCOM, Denunzio, Northeast Structural Steel, Ahern Painting. And they have some specialty subs that are also helping out. So, it takes a whole team to make something like this happen. The bridge itself is a suspension bridge with three spans, so it has back spans that are supported. The main span is 705 feet, which is somewhat short by suspension bridge standards. Uh, I do some work on the George Washington Bridge, one of my favorites, and um, this bridge almost looks like a toy bridge in comparison to that one. Um, total length of this bridge is a little over 1,000 feet. 10 and a half inch diameter main cables by John Roebling Sons. That's why we're here talking about it. Uh, just for comparison, the George Washington Bridge has 36 inch diameter cables and there's four of them. So this kind of gives you a sense of scale. Uh, the bridge has some unique features, including additional wires in the backstay that I'll show you a picture of what that means. The main cables are anchored into rock, which is fortunate, good geotechnical conditions, made for a great spot to make a suspension bridge. Um, you can reuse that rock mass to hold up uh, the tension in those cables. And the bridge is 37 foot wide out to out. So 27 feet between the cables. And then there has some uh, sidewalks outboard that are cantilevered outside. And the bridge carries two lanes, as you can see in the picture. Where is it located? It's in Kingston, New York. And this is kind of why the bridge has all these names. And it's kind of confusing because sometimes it's the Kingston Port Ewan Bridge. And sometimes it's the Rondout Creek Bridge because that's what it crosses. Uh, we refer to it as the Wirt Street Bridge. That's what the DOT refers to it as. So it's shown there on the map, Kingston, uh, kind of between Albany and, and New York City. One of the unique features and uh, facts about the bridge is it's the only suspension bridge wholly owned by the Department of Transportation. Well, how can that be? There's lots of suspension bridges in New York. Well, uh, all of the other ones are owned by various agencies, whether it be New York State Bridge Authority or the Port Authority, uh, Metropolitan Transit Authority, et cetera. In New York, we love our agencies. And uh, so this is the only one that the DOT actually owns. So a little bit <clears throat> about the history of the bridge. I was just talking to Lynn about how few photos and things, historical records are available of this uh, of this bridge. But uh, here's a few that we do have, um, kind of a neat picture showing the bridge itself with the ferry that it replaced uh, in front of it, which only happened for about one year. And if you can look directly under the bridge, uh, there's some, some big structures. That's actually, it was a shipbuilding uh, factory right underneath the bridge on a man-made island. So this is kind of a really interesting hot spot here on the Rondout Creek back in the um, turn of the century, a lot of activity. The um, last major reconstruction of the bridge was back in 1973 when it was redecked. They used precast post-tension panels. I'll explain a little bit why they did that and why we did something different this time around that we're replacing the deck. In 1979, the Route 9W was uh, relocated. So a new bridge was built adjacent to uh, the Wirt Street Bridge. So it's on the right in this particular picture, just to the east uh, of Wirt Street. And so that now carries all the major heavy trucks and things of that nature. Uh, that also played into our 
rehabilitation because uh, we were actually able to close the bridge while we did the work, which makes it uh, very nice, a lot safer for the contractor. Uh, in 1980, the bridge was listed on the National Register, which helped protect the bridge. Um, and I think was one of the reasons that we're uh, restoring it now. Very interesting um, bridge for bridge nerds like myself, uh, but also uh, for anybody who appreciates these types of structures, it's uh, designed by a very famous engineering firm of Steinman and Robinson. Uh, they uh, designed many iconic structures like the St. John's Bridge out in Oregon, Mount Hope Bridge in Rhode Island, and, and many others. They typically were of a uh, this sort of span, sub 1,000 feet structures, and um, it's, they're somewhat of a smaller breed and um, they, they are slowly diminishing. Uh, there was another bridge in um, Maine that's been taken down and replaced. So it's, it's great when we can restore and bring these, maintain these structures uh, going forward. It was constructed by Terry and Tench. Uh, they, are, they went out of business uh, shortly after constructing the Bear Mountain Bridge, but um, they were quite well known at the time having constructed the Williamsburg and the Manhattan Bridges down in New York City. And like I said, they went on to build the Bear Mountain Bridge right after Ward Street. So that was Bear Mountain was completed in 1924. I understand that there's gonna be a presentation all about that structure uh, as a future Roebling road trip. Um, another unique feature of the bridge is that it has continuous variable depth stiffening truss to the towers. What's a stiffening truss? What's all that mean? I'll explain a little bit more as I go through the presentation, but um, it's another feature that makes this bridge quite unique. and as a result of the continuous stiffening truss, there's no expansion joints at the towers. Um, and that's something that really has helped protect this bridge. Um, expansion joints are a source of deterioration, especially in New York where we love to put salt on our roads. And as I mentioned, it has additional cable strands in the backstay. So you can kind of see this, this shiv sort of feature here attached to the saddle. This is on top of the main tower. And these additional wires wrap up and around that shiv and. So the backstay cable is actually slightly larger in diameter. It was a very efficient design back then. Only a few suspension bridges have that feature. So I just wanna kind of give you a quick overview of how a suspension bridge works. Again, to kind of define some terminology and understand uh, it sort of informs how our work was done on this rehabilitation project. And suspension bridges are really interesting structures because of how efficient they are. And I think if I walk you through this, you'll, you'll see, um, they were really the, the favored structure for spanning long distances in the uh, turn of the century because of their simplicity in the design and construction. So the first step is to build the towers, naturally. Uh, you have to have your anchorages. In this case, we were right in rock, but sometimes anchorages are large concrete masses. They have to resist overturning uh, forces of the bridge. They, you know, they either you can go right into rock or have a large concrete structure. And then you spin and erect the main cable, and that's where Roebling would come in. They, they were responsible for the wires, and they would spin the main cables. Um, and then they would hang the suspender ropes. Roebling also would make the suspender ropes, and then they would hang those suspender ropes from the main cable. And then they would erect the stiffening truss. So you can see that all the components are supporting one another, and so it helps to uh, the sequence of construction is, is quite simple and uh, it's supported by the element that's erected private, previous to it. Tower links are installed in this particular bridge to connect the stiffening truss to the tower. Those are located at that location. And then there's bearings at the end of the bridge that also help connect the stiffening truss to the abutments. Suspension bridges are very efficient because the main cable resists tension forces only. And uh, the cable is, is very efficient at if, if transferring tension forces, but not so great at transferring uh, bending moments. And that's the purpose of the stiffening truss, which I'll explain. Those tension forces have to be distributed to the anchorage. So you see those forces in red. And the towers, of course, resist compression. So very simple tension and compression, in essence, a very simple structure. So because of the construction sequence where everything is hanging uh, from the main cable, the dead load stress in a stiffening truss of a suspension bridge is zero. So at ambient temperature, uh, that stiffening truss, that green element is under zero, zero stress, which is very unusual for a long span truss structure. Of course, the dead load is usually the largest component of the stress. 
So uh, suspension bridges are very much the opposite. Live load stress is different. Live load stresses are not zero. As a truck drives across the bridge, uh, the stiffening truss helps distribute that load to the main cable uh, so that the cable itself can just act in tension and not bending. Now, this is sort of an unusual case, but the stiffening truss stress, the dead load stress in the stiffening truss is not zero if the dead load stress, or excuse me, if the dead load is not uniform, if the dead load is not uniform. Now, when would that happen? Well, if you're removing the deck, uh, and that's what we're doing in this particular uh, instance, we have to replace the deck on the structure. So it turns out that removing that dead load of the deck uh, is actually causes more stress in the stiffening truss than any live load situation that the bridge would be subjected to. So this was uh, um, one of the most uh, important aspects of this project was uh, devising the staging plan to remove this, uh, the deck, but not overstress the components of the bridge, whether it be the deck or excuse me, the stiffening truss or the towers. And so we'll see that as I explain some of the photos going forward under the rehabilitation design and construction. So I started on this project back in like 2006. Um, it's been going on for a very long time. There was some starts and stops to it. <clears throat> but one of the first things we did was look inside the main cable. And we found that they were in excellent condition. So even as though this bridge was about 100 years old, uh, the cable was in almost pristine condition. Um, we had uh, some experts from New York State Bridge Authority also take a look while the cable was opened and um, they were they were, they were it was they were it was remarkable they said it was remarkable how good a condition that was in so that's a testament to Roebling and uh, the technology that they use and the materials that they used back in the day the anchorage eye bars unfortunately were uh, not so in not so great great a shape um, <clears throat> what was happening was water was flowing through the back wall of our anchorage uh, and the eye bars those where the arrow was pointing to those gray members and I'll have some more detailed photos of those um, they were heavily deteriorated due to corrosion. And so that naturally caused concern because the eye bars are what's holding up the main cable, which is in turn holding up the bridge, as I explained previously. So that was an obvious area of the concern that we had to address as part of our rehabilitation. And then the suspender hardware was also severely deteriorated, again, due to corrosion damage, um, salt spray, et cetera. Interestingly enough, the suspender ropes were in excellent condition. So again, both the Roebling components, the main cables and the suspender ropes themselves were virtually pristine after a hundred years, which is remarkable. Um, so we recommended a full rehabilitation option. And what does that mean? Uh, like I said, it, virtually every component of the structure is uh, being restored in one way, shape or form. So the anchorage, those eye bars that I mentioned are being worked on at four locations. We have tower anchor bolts. So naturally we have to hold the tower in position. Those anchor bolts were badly uh, deteriorated. So we're replacing those. The suspenders um, were all being replaced. As I mentioned, the suspenders themselves were in good shape, but the connections were not. So it made sense since they were hundred years old to replace all the components. And I'll have some photos of how we did that. The gusset plates were also suffered from corrosion deterioration, so we were able to replace them. Um, as I mentioned, dead load stress in a stiffening truss is zero under full load, so you can actually replace these gusset plates uh, rather easily. Uh, I guess don't tell the contractor I said that, but um, in terms of a, from a technical standpoint uh, and load distribution standpoint, it's fairly easy. Power links had to be replaced to make sure we hold the stiffening truss in place. Bearings had to be replaced. Again, a lot of deterioration just from corrosion over time. And a full cleaning and painting of the bridge. This will make it look like new. And then we're installing decorative lighting. So this is uh, anyone that's familiar with, <clears throat> you know, a lot of the suspension bridges in the city. They have decorative lighting, what they call necklace lighting on the main cables. Uh, that's what we're installing here. We're also going to be installing some uplighting on the towers. And all that's going to be uh, color changing and controlled virtually so that you can provide light shows, et cetera. It's going to be, I think, quite nice when we're done. So the rehabilitation scope of this project, we had to recognize that this was a historical structure. 
And so we really kept it as an in-kind rehabilitation. Uh, we did not want to change the historic nature of the structure, but we did want to naturally restore the structural capacity. The bridge was posted for five tons in this photo, but it went down to three tons at one point, and then it was actually closed uh, before the bridge was actually um, under construction. <clears throat> and it was closed because of those suspender connections that I mentioned. So they weren't safe for any kind of live load. Um, but yeah, as the bridge deteriorated, the live load capacity went down and um, we're obviously restoring that as part of this rehabilitation, but we are going to be, the bridge is actually still going to be posted when we're done, but it'll be posted for 20 tons. As I mentioned, that Route 9W is where all the heavy trucks are gonna go. Um, so this bridge will be safe for emergency vehicles and buses, but it was really never designed for the heavy trucks. So we're just kind of restoring it to its original condition, but not upgrading it to modern standards per se. We did have to provide some non-structural improvements, inspection access to be able to inspect the main cables and the towers. We are repainting it. We had to make the eight, the sidewalks ADA compliant. So we're providing some, some areas for passing zones. And uh, as I mentioned, the decorative lighting as well as highway lighting uh, to make it safe. So I'm gonna talk about a few of the elements. There's so many pieces to this bridge that I won't be able to talk about every single thing, but I picked a few of them that I thought would be of interest to everyone. So the anchorages in particular, um, they, they hold up the bridge. They're one of the most important things. So how did we fix those? Um, this is a picture from the original design plans that shows how the uh, anchorage eye bars were socketed into rock. And um, again, a very efficient design utilizing the natural features of, of the area. And so <clears throat> the, um, this, this picture here shows the, the main cable strands that are wrapped around a shoe. That shoe is in turn supported by these eye bars. And this is a top view of the eye bar. It's a little bit confusing, I know, to, for someone that's not familiar with it, but if you kind of zoom in on this area right here, you can see that there was a lot of section loss. So this was originally this width all the way through. And as that water was running down that back wall, uh, this has obviously been cleaned by sandblasting to remove all the rust and corrosion product. But this was uh, this was the result of 100 years of exposure. Interestingly enough, we removed the concrete uh, here to expose the remainder of the steel. And if you notice, there's just like a, a line right there. And that's that's where the original surface of the concrete was. So where the eye bar was embedded in concrete, it was protected by the concrete. Um, it was where it was exposed to the wetting and drying cycles um, just outside of the concrete surface that it was corroded. So there was in some cases up to 50% section loss here. And so that's why we had to um, perform. Uh, what we did was actually provide, provide offloading to uh, supplement the uh, anchorages. So what we did was <clears throat> we installed some rock anchors. And uh, there's a picture of the back, or there's kind of where the location of the back wall is. We installed these rock anchors. So we, we had to open up the roof of the anchorage, lower equipment down in there. They drilled these rock anchors uh, back into the rock mass. And those rock anchors are shown in elevation view on the left and then uh, in, a, in a section view on the right. If you notice, they had to span around the, that deviation casting. So that's why that lower, the lower pair is at a wider spacing. Uh, and you can kind of see that on the picture here on the, on the left that it had to clear that casting that was uh, encased in all the concrete. So these rock anchors were used to transfer load from the strands out to the, out to the rock anchors and then off partially offload the um, eye bars. And we, we offloaded them to a, the degree that um, they would have, we off, took out force out of the eye bars to compensate for the section loss so that they would have the original safety factor that they did when they were designed. The jacking system, uh, the way we did this uh, was not to bear directly on the uh, eye bars themselves, but on the strand shoe. Uh, the strand shoe is what's shown in blue and the jacking beam is shown in green. Uh, and so what happens is that 
jacking beam presses on that blue strand shoe, which then transfers loads uh, to the strand and picks up load from the bridge. Done properly, the bridge has no idea that we're doing this work. We're never actually moving the strands. We're simply transferring load out of the I bars into the rock anchors through this uh, jacking beam. Here's a picture of the existing uh, strands and anchorages uh, prior to uh, installing the jacking beams. Here's a picture of the anchorages as the roof was removed to allow access for all this construction equipment. You can really see how the strands, the photo on the left here, the strands are covered with like a green plastic. That's why you can kind of see them, but it's almost like the roots of a plant as the uh, main cable spreads out into the individual strands and then is anchored to the eye bars. On the picture on the right shows a mock-up of those jacking beams before they installed them. And then here's a photo uh, that was taken well, about a month ago as we installed the jacking beams and hooked them up to the rock anchors. And we utilized hydraulic jacks to transfer load between those two elements. Uh, that, that was accomplished without a hitch. Um, and we did, we've completed the work on the north side anchorage and the work on the south side anchorage is very similar and that'll be done uh, here next month. Suspender replacement is uh, one of the other components that I mentioned. The, all those, that hardware was in very bad shape. Um, it was deteriorated. It was responsible for us having to close the bridge at one point. And so um, we, that was another tricky operation, if you will, to, uh, to get this done. Um, the suspender connection is, is shown here. This happens to be a new one. Um, there's 114 suspender locations along each cable. The original connection consisted of I bolts, uh, U bolts, excuse me, that were riveted to the stiffening truss. And those I bolts, uh, the, excuse me, the U bolts were adjustable. You can see that they're, they have a threaded end with double nuts. And this is actually something that I er learned on one of these Roebling road trips. Um, why I noticed that all these older suspension bridges like the Wirt Street Bridge and the Bear Mountain Bridge had adjustable suspenders and later bridges like the Mid-Hudson Bridge right in Poughkeepsie and, and many others had uh, anchor sockets, which means no adjustability. Well, it turns out that Roebling invented what's called pre-stressing, pre-stretching of the uh, wire rope. Pre-stretching allows the um, construction stretch to come out of the rope and then it follows a, uh, a known elastic modulus. In other words, a linear line between stress and strain. And when you have a material that, with a linear relationship between stress and strain, you can calculate the length of the suspender for a given load. That's what we engineers do. Uh, we determine what the loads are and all the different elements, and then we can design for the length of those suspenders. Once you know the length, then there's no need for adjustability. So uh, now that that technology has been invented, we took advantage of that. We did not put back an adjustable suspender connection. We put back a solid rigid connection. Um, this makes it more maintenance friendly, um, reduces future maintenance, I should say, by take, eliminating those threaded components that can just simply deteriorate over time. Um, we utilized open sockets, which was a feature of the original bridge and was responsible for their longevity. And we moved all the components above the, the stiffening truss so that uh, you won't collect debris and, and, uh, and, and water and moisture, which is eventually what will lead to their corrosion. We also used all galvanized components in this area because it's very difficult to clean it and paint it properly. So here's some pictures of bolted connections. So this was one thing that we improved along the way to um, reduce future maintenance, but still keeping the original historic character of the bridge. The bridge has some unique features. This is uh, one of the cable bands themselves. And as I mentioned, very few historic records uh, of this bridge, including any lengths of the original suspenders or any other geometry. So we had to um, obtain all that geometry ourselves. We used that through a combination of LIDAR measurements using that's laser uh, measurements and uh, verifying it with a steel tape. 
uh, to make sure and corroborate those lengths and then with some calculations that I mentioned. So um, as it turns out, all the suspenders have been replaced and everything fit. So uh, hats off to the folks that did all the measuring and calculation, it all worked out. I mentioned that we were replacing the deck of this bridge. Uh, here's some photos of what it looked like beforehand. There were a lot of precast panels that were used. Those precast panels have joints. The joints are located uh, as highlighted in red. So basically over every floor beam and also at the mid pan of every floor beam. A lot of joints to leak and a lot of deterioration that was caused by those leaking joints. So we didn't want to replace, um, well, let me just back up a second. The reason that they use the precast panels, I, I was mentioning how the dead load stress and when the dead load stress is not equal and uniform, it, re, it, it results in higher stresses in the stiffening truss and loads on the towers if it's unbalanced, et cetera. So that was why they use precast panels. They can remove a very small portion of the deck and then insert a panel in its place so they don't have to uh, worry about uh, dead load removal. We wanted to use a little bit different system. We wanted to use a cast in place system. We wanted to use larger pores, fewer joints to uh, improve the longevity of our structure. As a result of that, we had to do quite a, quite a lot of analysis of the stiffening truss to see how large of an area of the deck that we could remove without overstressing the towers and the, and the stiffening truss itself. So that was why they used one panel at a time back in the 70s. And that was why we used uh, cast in place construction here. Um, fewer joints, higher quality joints, but at the expense of some additional analysis. This is kind of, this picture kind of shows what the bridge wants to do before all the dead load is on it. Um, the stiffening, this is a picture of the bridge as it was being built. It's before the deck was placed, the concrete deck was placed, but while the steel was being erected. And um, you can see that when all the dead load is not on the bridge, it has a pronounced rise in the very center of the span because the cables are effectively shorter than they were calculated to be. Um, as you place the dead load of the deck on the bridge, uh, the bridge settles into its final geometry and the stiffening truss takes that parabolic shape that it's designed for. Um, so again, that just kind of il illustrates visibly how the bridge is designed and how it um, wants to behave under that full uniform dead load condition. So we had, as I mentioned, uh, we had to look at construction staging. In other words, limits of deck removal and placement in order to um, maintain the stiffening truss within acceptable stress limits. Um, we also had to account for the fact that the contractor was going to use equipment on the bridge that had a certain amount of weight to it, uh, placing concrete, concrete trucks, et cetera. So we had a, a load allowance and we came up with this staged construction consisting of six separate stages. If you notice they're symmetrical about the towers because you need to keep the loads balanced on the bridge so that you don't overstress the towers. The contractor made some modifications and very clever ones, I might add, uh, that made it easier for him to access some repairs, uh, as well as reducing the number of stages that need, that the work could be accomplished in. His first modification was to remove the sidewalks uh, and some of the concrete um, along the stiffening truss. He added temporary concrete barrier as a counterweight. So as I mentioned, you have to have that uniform dead load and the dead load uh, needs to be maintained. So he compensated for any of the concrete that he was removing by adding these heavy concrete barriers. So you can see here that those areas that were removed in red were compensated for by the weight of the temporary concrete barrier. So it was very clever. And in order to eliminate a couple of the stages, we had six stages, uh, he was able to eliminate it down to four, um, he was able to add some counterweight. So again, you can use larger limits of deck removal if you compensate for the weight in another way. So he used water-filled containers here uh, to control uh, the deformations of the structure and allow him to increase the limits of the stages. And so uh, the way this was done is these um, large bins were hanging from the stringers. Uh, they were filled with water as the deck was removed. 
And then as the deck was placed, the water was actually drained out of these bins at the same speed so that again, the main, the, the dead load on the structure was maintained. So it was a very, um, very elegant solution actually to, uh, to achieving that dead load balance that we were looking for. And that's a picture of the structure here recently with the completed deck. Some of the barriers are still there, just as counterweight because he has not placed the uh, sidewalks at the time. So again, to maintain the uniform dead load, there was some ballast effectively that was out there. Obviously the bridge still needs to be painted and some other things, but we're making some good progress and we expect the construction to be complete by the end of the year. Um, with that, uh, I was gonna, that was gonna be the end of the slides that I had. I was just trying to keep it to a certain, uh, duration and this way I can ask or answer any questions that folks have. Um, so I'll open it up to the floor. All right, we'll start with the most important question that I didn't submit, just FYI. What happens to the original suspender cables? Because I know a museum who would like to have one. I've got some set to the side for you. Good. Um, did anyone think to sell pieces of suspender cable? I bet you can't do that, right? You could scrap them, maybe? You could scrap them. Uh, I'm not aware. It, they, the contractor owns them. I mean, that's how the way it works is he he uh, he gets to remove and dispose of it. Um, so I suppose it, it, would, it might be possible because he does, does own the material. Uh, but I, I've not heard any, of anything like that being done. But he is he is setting aside some of the some of the pieces for us and for the museum. Happy birthday, Roebling Museum. Okay. Um, what was the most challenging aspect of this project for you? And what was the biggest surprise you encountered? The most challenging aspect, I mean, <clears throat> I would say it was, um, you know, probably just the, the pace of construction. Um, there was many unknowns, uh, the lack of information, uh, original plans, things of that nature. We knew going into this project that we were going to have to figure things out as we went. Um, there's a lot of times that you can do as much inspection as possible, but until you remove the concrete deck, you don't really know the condition of the steel underneath. Until you remove some of the anchorage concrete, you don't necessarily know all the conditions. So we knew that we were going to have to adjust on the fly, and we did. But that made made it very challenging because you just didn't have time to react. Uh, you were you were trying to figure things out as the the bridge was being constructed, and so you had to keep everybody you know moving on pace. I would say that was the most challenging. But in in a way, a lot of the things that we predicted in terms of how to replace the suspenders and how to offload the anchorages and how to replace the deck, um, you know, the big picture items went according to to plan. Uh, so one of my questions actually is, when can I walk on it? So I'm going to be up there on vacation in July. Is that too okay. soon? Is it next year I have to walk? Wait, or when does it reopen? It's it's not going to reopen until next year officially. Um, if you give me a heads up, then maybe I can arrange a, a site visit with the with the uh, resident. Yeah, my husband loves being dragged on Roebling road trips in real life. <laughs> yes. I uh, they've they're used to doing some tours out there because of the the interest in this in this structure. So, um, you know, as you saw, the the deck has been replaced, so it's it's actually pretty safe to to walk out there. It just is an active construction site, but um, generally they can accommodate it with some advance notice. Um, but someone did actually ask a real question: Are there any plans to celebrate the opening? Certainly there are. Um, I, I don't know exactly all the plans. I can tell you that there's a, uh, a cornerstone with a, um, oh, what's the term? Um, drawing a blank. Uh, when you have a- uh, Like a date stone? When you bury a, when you bury a time oh, capsule. Oh, yeah, yeah, time yeah. Time capsule. Time so they, they have a time capsule that's going in there. Um, and um, as I mentioned, all the lighting that's being installed on this on this bridge is gonna really, facilitate having uh, quite a display, I think, when it's when it's all said and done. So um, at this point, it will be 2024 when that happens. Um, 
I don't know the exact date, but as we get closer, yeah, I'm I'm certain they're going to have a a big opening for this. And if the museum finds out, we will absolutely share it with with everyone who's here today. Um, let's see. Was stainless steel rebar in the deck? I am not reading this correctly. I know that little about engineering. Can you see the question, please? Yes, I see it. <laughs> um, we we did use a type of stainless steel. It was chromium steel, so it was not a full stainless steel, uh, but it was a higher strength and higher corrosion resistant uh, rebar. It was it was not epoxy coated. It was a a chromium based rebar. And epoxy paints used on repainting. I know it's a three-part uh, system, um, but I don't know exactly the components of the painting system. Do the towers deflect bend from the time of no load to returning back to the load? They do. Yes, they absolutely do. As the cable, you know, the cable is. Uh, has a saddle that goes over top of, of the cable, but as, uh, excuse me, over the top of the tower. But as the cable sees additional load, whether it be from live load or winds or what have you, uh, it elongates. And as that cable elongates, then that tower is going to move. Uh, I wouldn't say that those are necessarily perceptible movements, but when you do a survey of the bridge, which the contractor had to do, um, you know, there's, there's feet of movement, certainly at mid-span vertically, and that there's going to be some translation of the towers to allow that. So the bridge suspension bridges tend to be very flexible. Uh, they're always moving. Yes. Was this ever a toll bridge? And if so, what happened to the toll houses? It was never a toll bridge. It was always owned by New York State. Um, so it was it was there was never an agency involved. And so there was never any tolls. Um, back to no original blueprints. I had told Blaze earlier, we're gonna go look downstairs when I'm at the museum <laughs> tomorrow. Um, but uh, unfortunate that no original blueprints exist. Is that what have happened? It, it is unusual. We, we do a lot of work on historic bridges. Um, the Bear Mountain Bridge in particular, you know, is very interesting because it was not always owned by the New York State Bridge Authority. It was actually owned by a private uh, company that charge the toll. Um, and yet those plans exist. They they survived from the original owners over to uh, the new owners. And yet, um, you know, New York State DOT always owned this bridge. We do have what plans that they have, but they were approximately 10 drawings and not very accurate. So, um, which is not, to some extent, not terribly unusual, but no original shop drawings, um, no details of the cables or suspenders. You know, just just somewhat schematic design drawings, which back in the 20s were, you know, they were they were not very detailed. So none of the original information that you would expect, especially uh, when you'd have the original owner. So that was I would say that that is unusual. It is unusual. So we better find them at the museum, right? That, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, here is an interesting question. Is lightning a threat to the structure? I wouldn't think so because everything's grounded. Um, and I, I've not heard of any issues uh, of the bridge um, being affected by lightning. The All the new electrical system that we're going to be installing is also grounded and protected um, from those types of things. So, um, you know, I, I think that is an issue that you have to be aware of on bridges. They're certainly susceptible to lightning strikes, but I've not heard of any any damage and I wouldn't expect it going forward. Uh, several people asked if the Zoom will be recorded. Uh, all of these programs that we've done since 2020 are on our YouTube channel. So you can go and check out all of them. It, you know, we're a staff of 1.75, so it takes a little bit for them to get uh, edited and put up, but probably in the next week or two. So take a look at our YouTube channel. Um, someone else commented, said the original brass dedication plaque is at the Hudson River Maritime Museum. That's the one that's right 
over there, I think, the museum right under the bridge. I'll have to remember that. Okay. I, I didn't know that. Um, interesting. I'll have to check that out, too. Here's an I see there's a few, other, I see there's yeah. a few other questions. Yeah. I see one about stress, strain, displacement gauges. Um, we did use uh, strain gauges as part of the anchorage offloading to basically verify that we were uh, removing load from the I bars as we predicted. Um, so we were measuring the loads that we were inputting through the jacking operation during strain of the I bars to uh, verify that we were getting the results that we anticipated. But there is no other gauges or structural health monitoring permanently uh, mounted on the bridge. But we were able to utilize the strain gauges in real time as we were performing the jacking operations to adjust the jacking loads. Um, I see another one about the main cables. How are the main cables open for inspection? Were any of the wires cut out and tested for torsion or elongation? Um, the main, it, it's, it's really a uh, simple, somewhat simple procedure for main cables. Um, there's usually a circumferential wrapping wire that surrounds the cables that has to be cut off. And then they uh, drive wedges between the individual, between the wires in a, in a certain pattern. And um, you inspect the, the wires essentially down into the center of the cable. Um, that's a pretty consistent procedure that's utilized on most suspension bridges and that's how we performed it. And then yes, we did remove some sample wires that were cut out and tested for well, stress and strain basically to determine their properties. And um, all that was done back in 2007. Is the bridge on the Mercer County Administrative Building in Trent, New Jersey, an example of the stress work the Roebling Company worked on? Don't know that one. I feel like that one is mine to answer and I do not know the answer, Carol. I'll let you know though. And if anyone else knows the answer, type it into the chat and then we'll say it out loud. <laughs> Social media and light shows. I, yes, I'm. I'm confident that it'll definitely be on social media. I, I expect it'll be pretty spectacular. Actually, I, I don't know. Um, there's not too many system, too many bridges that's got, that are going to have such a sophisticated system. Anybody that's familiar with, like, say the the new Mario Cuomo bridge and the lighting out there, um, it, I, I expect it to be pretty impressive. I hope so. Fingers crossed. How did the cable spinning process on this bridge compare with the way Roebling made its other bridges of the same era? Very similar. The very similar aerial spinning techniques were used here. Uh, this was an early bridge, 1922. One of the things that was different, uh, not so much about the spinning process itself, but as the individual strands were being formed, they, they packed grease, petrolatum, uh, in between the strands as the cable was being uh, constructed. And so you had this petrolatum distributed all through the cross section of the cable. And a lot of the earlier bridges were constructed that way. Uh, Brooklyn Bridge is what, another one. And uh, that was actually what was responsible for preserving this cable in such excellent condition. As the speed of construction increased, uh, as the pressure to build bridges quicker uh, occurred, they eliminated this petrolatum and just you relied on the galvanized coating of the wires, um, which does work. But what happens is uh, if some of the other bridges in the area where we, they, petrolatum was not used throughout the interior surfaces, water can collect in there. The, the advantage of the petrolatum is the water comes in and just flows right out because it has no sort of nooks and crannies. So they're all filled up with grease. So, um, that was a unique aspect of this particular bridge, and and uh, and that was something that was Roebling's invention, and uh, was really responsible for preserving this cable in the state that it did. How can you inspect the internal condition of the cables without some destruction of them? It's typically a visual inspection, as I mentioned. You remove the wrapping wire to see them. You wedge things open to look at them. Um, we do have to. We do remove a few samples as the previous question 
alluded to, uh, and then by determining the condition of those wires, you extrapolate those conditions to the other wires that you're able to inspect. Where are the expansion joints located? Are the tower foundations on rock? The expansion joints are only at the very ends of the bridge. So because of that continuous stiffening truss, there's no intermediate expansion joints, um, just at the very ends of the bridge. And are the tower foundations on rock? Yes, they are. Rock is very close to the surface um, on both sides of the river here. So that made for ideal conditions for a suspension bridge. Is the new deck designed for a asphalt overlay at some future point when repair work may be needed? No. We um, we designed this. Uh, the dead load of the bridge was was very sensitive, and so um, it's designed as a bare deck, no no asphalt overlay. And uh, if there is there's sort of a integral overlay, in other words, additional cover built into the concrete itself, but there's not an additional allowance for asphalt overlay. They would have to repair the concrete deck itself. Was the sequence for pouring the concrete deck during the rehab similar to the sequence during bridge construction? Um, I would say it's similar, but generally speaking, um, when it was under construction, if you recall that one photo that I had uh, of the stiffening truss having that sort of unusual shape. Um, they actually, I didn't necessarily point it out, but the stiffening truss was not fully connected. All the uh, joints of the stiffening truss were not fully connected. So that allowed the stiffening truss to actually move. So <clears throat> they typically would pour the concrete deck from the center and work outward, uh, balanced on both sides, but they would work from the center out. And then as the stiffening truss and the rest of the cable assumed the final geometry, then they would go back in and make those final connections. So in that sense, it was a little bit different than what we were doing now, because we weren't able to uh, disassemble the stiffening truss. Where did you get the wrapper to rewrap the cables? Um, it is, it's, it's just a, a, a small diameter wire, uh, galvanized wire. So it's, fairly readily available and uh it's it's commonly employed on on suspension bridges they're kind of common sizes and uh that's what we used um in the chat someone asked uh did you already answer this do the saddles move and are they lubricated saddles are do not move on this particular bridge they're uh directly connected to the tops of the towers. Uh, this bridge was erected by tilting the towers backwards slightly during construction, and then the towers rotated forward as the cables elongated into their final position, and then they uh, installed all the anchor bolts. So that was, that was how they compensated. The larger bridges are ones where they typically have the saddles on rollers because they employ a rigid tower. So this was sort of a uh, unique construction technique. All right, well, the rest of the questions and comments are just grateful thank yous from people who really enjoyed this program. And we're actually at the end of our time here as well. Um, the one comment that I was thinking the entire time is I'm from like the historic preservation world. And, you know, you learn about doing it for houses, you learn about restoring, I've even learned about uh, boats, but never bridges and it is a lot more complicated and dangerous than restoring a house so thank you so much um for for I sharing i kind of liken it to restoring an old car you know you, you got to cut out the old steel and you got to put some stuff back and you got to figure out what can you fix and what can't you fix and where to get all the pieces so yeah it's or dentistry i also think about that <laughs> you know, it's like it's kind of similar to that you know you get preventative maintenance and uh, all these things so well that's really great. Thank you so much, Blaze. And just as a reminder, you can find this and all of our other uh, programs on our YouTube account. So thanks everybody for being here. Thanks, Blaze. And Thank you. have a good night. Good night, everyone.